after getting so close uh, for the previous uh, six years. Uh, I was beginning to wonder if I would ever get to come here uh, after 41 years of coaching, which means if that rate keeps up, I'll be 106 the next time <laughs> <laughs> we get to come here. But that was the scene at the White House when Bobby Bowden and the Florida State Seminoles were honored by the President of the United States for their national championship season. And this is Campbell Stadium on the campus of Florida State University in Tallahassee. This place has been called the house that Bobby built. Before Bowden arrived in 1975, FSU had a second-rate football team on a long losing streak. They'd only won four games in the previous three seasons. But nowadays, it's expected Bobby Bowden's team will play for the national championship every year. Reporters love to talk to Coach Bobby Bowden because they say he takes his work seriously, but not himself. And if you spend any time at all with this man, one of the winningest coaches in history, it won't take you long to find out why he holds his own tremendous ability so lightly. I am a Christian. Why? Because I believe, because I trust, and because I commit myself. I'm saved through grace. You see, not something I did, but something I believe and something I've committed to. God does not need Bobby Bowden's ability. God could replace me at Florida State just like that. Just like that. God could say, Bobby, you're out of here. I want so-and-so. They'll do better. And it would happen. You see. So what does God want with me? He doesn't want my ability. What does he want? He wants simply my availability. And he has been available. For about 30 years now, he has given himself completely to the making of disciples. Disciples of his brand of football, teamwork, fair play, and really of his take on life. The principles he has developed and uses to mold the young men in his charge have a familiar feeling. They ring with the authority of biblical teaching. As you listen to Coach Bowden explaining, illustrating, questioning his players, challenging them to go beyond themselves, it's easy to remember that Jesus of Nazareth called together a group of rough, untrained men whose temperaments and abilities were tremendously different, but in each of whom he saw a potential kingdom builder. And you also remember that part of what eventually transformed those disciples into a powerful, unstoppable team was that they watched their leader get his strength daily from his relationship with his Heavenly Father. And they also watched him lay his life down before his judges, for them, with dignity and peace. Well, I was born in Birmingham, Alabama, November the 8th, 1929, and of course lived in Alabama, Birmingham, uh, for the first uh, 30 years of my life. You know, I've coached in Georgia, I've coached in Florida, coached in Alabama, coached in West Virginia, and of course, I've, I've always longed to be back uh, where I was raised, which is in the, in the Deep South. I can remember the first time I ever played football. Let's say when I was 15 years of age, for the first time in my life, I went out for competitive sports. I was fast and I was very quick when I was small, could catch a ball, because I'd played with one all my life. And so, boy, just, I just love football as a kid. Baseball, too, but football, mostly. So I went out for the team during spring training, not knowing what to expect. So got my shoes, they were that far too big. Got my old pants, got a shirt, shoulder pads, helmet that you can spin it on <laughs> right on your head, you know? And I probably weighed 115 pounds at that time, see? But nobody else was very big back in those days, but that was probably one of the smallest ones. So anyway, I, I finally go out for the team. Well. For the first time, they sent us against the varsity, and they put me at defensive halfback. And I'm sitting back at defensive half, and this is my first time to get into a skirmish. Now, this is a skirmish. I can remember just as plain a day the place it was on the field. I can remember the direction we were facing. We were, we were going across the field, and I'm over here at left defensive halfback, and they run a playoff tackle. And I move in there to make the tackle, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make the tackle, and all of a sudden, one of the ends comes from the side, and I never see him. I never see him. He blindsides me. 
he hits me in the head and he knocks me, I bet he knocked me five yards back. I mean, he just ran right through my head, you know? I was just fixing to make the tackle and that guy killed me. And when I got up, I got up, I said, what have I gotten myself into? The X's and O's is just not a big part of football. It's, it's there. You've got to have a structured way of running a play and a defense. But boy, it gets down to heart. It gets down to soul. It gets down to enthusiasm. It gets down to desire. It gets down to attitude, you know. And all those things have to come from inside of a guy, you know. Like most successful coaches, Bobby Bowden is a student of human nature. He is also one of the great motivators of our time. Over the years, he's known exactly what he wants from his players, what attributes, what skills, what types of behavior. It's amazing some of the greatest characteristics of being a winning football player are the same ones that's true to be a good man, to be a religious man, to be a, in my case, Christian man. Now just some thoughts of some things that we want to do good today. X and Z's, downfield blocking. Offensive line, again, you must just get your man. Don't let your man get our quarterback. Don't let your man get our quarterback. Block your man on his back when we run the football. He wants to be their father away from home. You know, you're going to leave this family and he's going to be the head of the family over here. Nowadays in time, you're, you're getting a, a young person that is void pretty much of responsibility and accountability and obedience and, and uh, respect for authority. You're getting a lot of people that aren't accustomed to having that because of the destruction of the family unit. And you are the father, you are the psychiatrist, you are the psychologist. You're a bunch of things. Just like a father is a family, the coach is the same thing with the team. I'm sorry that we've had some injuries, but we've had fewer than we've ever had. I hope the good Lord will continue to take care of you. And uh, let's ask him to here, okay? Dear, dear God, we pray, I thank you for these boys, and I pray that you'll take care of them today. This is a tough game, it's a physical game, it's a game of risk. And we just ask you'll protect them from injury. Then heal the ones that are injured. Then help these young men to do their best. Help them to play as hard as they can play. Once that ball snapped, play as hard as they can play and just help them to do the best they can do. Give our coaches wisdom. These things we pray in thy name, amen. I think one of my dad's greatest characteristics is perspective. His, he has great perspective about the priorities of his life. He keeps football in perspective. He keeps adversity in perspective. He keeps things which he can't control in perspective. Uh, to him, he understands very basically, very clearly and very simply the priorities of his life, the things that are important. The values that he has, the things that he believe in, they're very simple and they're very easy to understand. And so he does not worry about those things that he cannot control. Now let me tell you what it takes to make a winning player. Now you listen to me. I've got to have discipline. I've got to have obedience. I've got to have boys who love each other and will fight for each other. I've got to have boys that are loyal i got to have boys that are enthusiastic. Now, do you know that enthusiastic meant full of God? I've got to have boys who will sacrifice. I've got to have boys who will train their bodies. I've got to have boys who have courage. I've got to have boys who have resolution. Discipline is such an important uh, characteristic. I think it's probably the most important characteristic a man can have. You simply are not going to win in football if your team's not disciplined. The problem with our society today is we're not disciplined. Our people are not disciplined. A democracy is dependent upon disciplined people. That's the way a democracy works. And without it, democracy is going to fall. Maybe through football, we're helping a little bit, you know, discipline these young men. I think it's important for a football coach or a leader to, to, to represent uh, a certain image, to try to show them certain types of, uh, of things that we believe, believe in, in, whether it be values or work ethic, uh, uh, principles or whatever, and present these daily to all of our football players. 
so that they can begin to understand uh, maybe what it means to lead other people, what it means to be responsible to other people, uh, what they may do uh, to fulfill their, their potential, to fulfill the goals that they have in their life. When you fake an isolation or a sprint draw, who does that affect? Linebackers, what do they do? They come up when you fake that dive. Obedience is a mighty so big thing uh, in values. Line. First, I think we need to be obedient to God. I think we need to be obedient to the moral laws. We have moral responsibilities. Every human being's life needs to be grounded in some kind of basic values. And when I say basic values, I mean values that aren't transient or ephemeral. Uh, they need something that is sound enough to get them through the great diversity of life's experiences. Especially for athletes, good athletes, as we see these days in the news, who are constantly in the limelight, who have images projected upon them, even at the high school level, uh, and who therefore find themselves with an, with a, an excess of opportunities and an excess of responsibilities. It's very important for them to have some firm sense of, of bearing in life. I think we need to be obedient to our parents. I think we need to be obedient to the, the laws of a land, you know. And I think we need to be obedient to the team laws. Defensive line, it's the same old story. Attack, but attack lower. Attack lower than you've been attacking. As I look at that film, I thought you attacked better last scrimmage, but you're still attacking too high. When you defensive linemen attack, it destroys the offense. It destroys them for one of you guys to get penetration back in there. It just ruins the offense. Get that penetration. It, it used to be years ago when I first started playing football. It, you didn't talk about love and football in the same sentence. You love, you, how could you play football in love? I'll tell you how you can play football in love. Teams that, we, we talk about teams having the chemistry, man. This ball club had good chemistry. I think what that means is you got a bunch of boys that love and care for each other. You see, when somebody loves somebody, they'll fight for them. When somebody loves somebody, for they'll defend them. When somebody loves somebody, they're not going to let somebody hurt that person, you see? And that's a big thing in football. All the sons played for their father, and the three who went into coaching all coached for him at one time or another. While they acknowledge their dad's influence, sometimes the competitive nature of the sport takes precedence, as in a recent recruiting trip that Terry and Tommy took. We recruited a boy here in state. Terry probably told you about that daddy went in and visited. And his first home visit I've ever had with Terry. I've had home visit with daddy and went there and Terry. I cringed in the corner. I was cold-blooded. He went after him. <laughs> he and I said, no, this is, surely he's not saying this about our dad. <laughs> oh, man, alive. Let me get out of here. Mm. No false step. Tommy, let me mention something. Okay, hold up. Now, he's talking about looking down Phil when you come off that line. Why? Give me some, give me some reasons. All right. Pardon? Don't give away your pattern. All right, that's right. If he sees you looking, he knows you can get the ball, doesn't he? All right, and what's another reason? Yeah, you ever see those pro cornerbacks when the ball is snapped there right here? Then they come running up here and try to take your head off, and you looking in there, you're dead, ain't you? You better find out what's happening down here, hadn't you? Sir, <coughs> that's an excellent point. I should have covered that. You, I told you to mention that's that in the meeting. You didn't do now. it. We brought him in as a special. <laughs> that's a good coaching point now. That's why you got to look now. Phil, when the ball snap. There you go. There you go. Good. Nice, nice catch. Job. Nice catch, son. If you can find the key to enthusiasm, you got something because you take two football teams that go out on a football field, you got 50 guys there. They come out to play each other. Uh, physically, they're equal. Big, both of the same size, both have the same speed, both have the same height. But one team is enthusiastic, see? The other team maybe is not enthusiastic. Maybe this enthusiasm starts from a coach or a, one player that kind of, because enthusiasm is catching. It's catching. One guy gets it, another one gets it, you know? But I really think it's a, uh, it's a strength, it's an inner strength. Now, I personally feel like it comes from God, you know, enthusiasm, that little something down inside that makes you excited and happy and, and willing to give of yourself, that explosion that comes from within, 
that, uh, that, that motivates a man to really go out and do the best he can do, you know, and have a good time while he does it. That's, that's enthusiasm to me. I tell my coaches, when, when they look at my list of requirements every year, first thing I got is loyalty. It was the first thing, coaches, you are going to be loyal. We're going to be loyal to each other. I won't defend you. You're going to have to defend me. You know, it starts there with loyalty. That's why I've never left Florida State. I've been here 18 years. I've had great opportunities to leave. But I have a sense of loyalty to Florida State University, and I, and I just I love it. I remember the very first time I, time I became a graduate assistant for my father at Florida State University. And I was so eager to become a big old football coach and, and do all the things that coaches do. I said, Dad, what's my job? What do you want me to do, go out and invent new offenses and, and find all the great players? And he said, you know, Terry, your job is to please the head coach. That's your job, and that's your only job, to please the head coach. And my first introduction to loyalty. One of the highest callings in a religious life is sacrifice. And uh, you take any religion you want to study, it begins with sacrifice. Now, I don't know of anything that, where sacrifice is more important than football. You know, it's true in a lot of sports. But I mean, you must be willing to sacrifice your body. You must be willing to, be willing to put your body into position where it can be injured and hurt and harmed. You must put yourself in harm's way to be successful in football. And that's sacrifice, you know? Uh, tight ends, tight ends, make 46 go. 46, the sweep. That play is it's, it's dependent upon the tight end's block. If he don't get his block, it breaks down. Now think about that. We're on that 46, you get your man. That's one of the highest callings of a man's religious faith. There is a man that's willing to sacrifice for, his, for, for others, whether it's life, whether it's in death, whether it's in money, or whether it's in service, or, or whatever. Sacrifice is so important in football and, 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 and succeeding with your fellow man. Secondary, let's see you break on that ball today when it gets in the air. Break on that football and just go after it. Don't let them have the long one because we can stop them on the goal line. A man needs to take care of his body. Uh, if a man is going to perform a strenuous act, physical activity, he needs that body in good shape. He needs to eat the right foods. He needs to maintain the correct weight. He needs to lift weights. He needs to get stronger, faster, work hard, and persevere, and, and again, sacrifice, you know. And so a man needs to keep his body fit. You cannot uh, train your body unless you're mentally hungry for it and are willing to sacrifice. And again, it does start, start mentally. I've always, well, I tell our players everything starts mentally. In other words, the body doesn't do anything that the mind doesn't tell it to do. If I want this body to perform, my mind has got to tell it what to do. You wide outs, you hardly ever get hit. You play a whole football game, all them linemen in there getting killed, the quarterback's getting wiped out when he throws the football, and runners are getting killed. You wide outs hardly ever get a hit. So when your time is called to come inside and get it, you have got to come in there and get it. Now, what if the mind don't want to tell it? Well, that's where the spirit becomes so important. The inner man, the, the motivation, the thing that motivates us, that enthusiasm that I was talking about, you know. But I go back to spirit, 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 because that's what turns that motor on, you know. And then that brain tells that body, let's get going, man. Let's jump higher. Let's run faster. Let's hit harder than the other guy. Linebackers, knock your way through. Linebackers, they got somebody assigned to you. He's going to come get you. Don't catch him. Knock your way through him. Through his head, primarily, and get to the ball. You can't play football without physical courage because anytime you have two men running together as hard as they can trying to defeat the other in a in a running contact man I mean you're talking about something physical you're talking about something dangerous you're talking about something adventurous you know and and and, and it takes some courage if you're going to be the best now coach mentioned coach mentioned the square in Ain't it, ain't it fun coming across the middle and catching those kind? And somebody hits you right in the mouth by the time you catch. Ain't that fun? Anybody can catch an out. Anybody can catch a takeoff. 
But the pros want to know who will catch it coming across the middle. That's the first thing they ask us when we talk about our receivers. Will he catch it coming across the middle? Well, not too good. Yeah, he'll catch it. He ain't scared of nobody. See? Now, you think about that when you go back to your high school. Because we ain't going to have nobody in the middle hitting you now, are we? But you got to make that catch. You got to concentrate. And you got to take your licks. I think resolution is just determination that you're going to do whatever it takes, you know, and you've got to have resolution. Uh, you, we can call it a perseverance. But what this season really teaches is a lesson that Coach Bowden and I both understand, the power of perseverance. You and your team didn't quit when the sports writer said you couldn't win the big one. You didn't quit after you lost a tough game to a great Notre Dame team. You didn't quit when you were trailing Nebraska with a minute and 16 seconds left on the clock in the Orange Bowl. And in the end, when everything was on the line, you believed in yourselves, you stayed together as a team, and you got the job done. I talk to my kids about persistence, persistence. Persistence might be the greatest trait of all that you can have. Persistence to me is probably having all of those other uh, things, uh, using them and staying with them. Just will not give up, will not quit, will not quit uh, resolution, will not give up, will not quit, will not accept defeat, you know. We'll give everything I've got. We'll train so hard that I can't, that I have to drag myself off the field and practice, you know. That's re resolution. You've got to have resolution to put all those other things together. And really the whole principle of sports is to prepare young people for an adulthood in dealing with other people. It'd be nice, it'd be nice to be first team when we finish spring training. First team, you know. So all summer, you're first team. You're first team. You come back in here, first team. Now there's some jobs out there that are close. Grab those jobs or make that guy in front of you an All-American. Last Sunday I was speaking at a Methodist church and uh, the pastor asked me, he said, uh, speaking to our church, you, you being a Southern Baptist, aren't you, are you a little self-conscious about that? I said, no, I'm not self-conscious at all. I said, you know, we're, we, we, we worship different in, in some ways, uh, maybe baptized different, uh, but we're all, you know, basically, we, we're interested in the same thing. And so, you know, y'all continue to do it your way, and, you know, we'll continue to do it his. But... <laughs> That's a joke, Glenn. <laughs> I think Daddy's strongest, absolute strongest character trait is that he is going to live what he believes. Uh, if he has a value, he's going to stand by it, and he is not going to break it. See, I speak nearly every Sunday at some church. I'd a lot rather be home with Ann uh, and with our family, you know, but I really feel like I must, I, I need to do I feel like I'm called to do that. It shocked me when I heard my father get up on a podium in a church and say that uh, he's not perfect, he's a sinner, I do wrong. You know, it's just, I've always thought he was perfect. I always thought he was great. And then to hear him say that really, it really helped me. Because, you know, sometimes, sometimes I've, I have held him so high and tried to work up to that, you know, it's really hard to do. And it would really help me to hear him say that. Am I perfect? No, I didn't say that. I said, I'm a Christian. No, I'm not perfect. Nobody's perfect. You know. Well, do, do I sin? Yes, I do. You know, I ain't going to tell you how. <laughs> and I am not going to tell you what. I try not to. But yes, I do. You know. Uh, well, are you saved? Yes. Yes. Yes, I'm saved. Now, what do I mean by saved? Saved to me means when I die, I will live again, just as Christ lived again. Now, if Christ had not died on that cross, and if Christ had not come out of that grave three days later, I wouldn't be telling you this, you see? But I know it happened. And I know it's going to happen to me. It's the... Christian principles that, that Christ taught to me that are so important in holding a group of people together, the faith, the trust, 
the sacrifice, the love. Uh, that, uh, those, that's foot stuff you got to have in football too. You know, we've all got good players. Everybody's got good players. The key is who can get those players together and get the chemistry just right where they'll go out as a unit and as a team and win. And, and, and the qualities and the character that, that uh, you know, of Christian teachings is very beneficial to football players, in my opinion. That's why I say I'm, that's why I say I'm a Christian. That's why I say I will go to heaven. Because I do believe, you know. And he says, whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Amen. That's me. Discipline. Obedience. Love. Loyalty. Enthusiasm. Sacrifice, physical fitness, courage, resolution. It hasn't been easy, but the results are absolutely undeniable. Jesus promised that he would make his followers fishers of men. And following Jesus, Coach Bobby Bowden has long fulfilled his promise to make winners of men. As a Christian, he captures hearts and minds and turns them to Jesus. As a coach, he captures the loyalty of his players and turns it to the team. And as a strategist, he captures victory after victory after victory and turns the whole watching world to joy. A football for him has been the anvil upon which he has hammered out his identity as a human being. Uh, it is the background against which he has worked out his own sense of personal destiny. I think it's where he came to discover who Bobby Bowden is. And so football, while it has been his one great vocational passion and love in life, also gradually came to be for him, I think, the, the uh, point from which he was able to influence the lives of other people. And I think that changed how he understood himself. And so he became, uh, in an old biblical sense, a kind of evangelist for life as he understood it. He has great faith. He has great faith that if he lives according to the rules that he believes in, which would be his Christian values, that all things will work out for best. And he has complete and total faith in that. I'm one of those guys that thinks that, that God created everything. God created everybody. God gave everybody a job, and I'm just thankful for what he's given me.